Good evening, friends. It's so good to see you this evening. God has been so good to us, and we had wonderful services last Sunday. We're going to have the same this Sunday. Remember the times this Sunday, 930. That's for those who are 60 and over, or those who fall into the high-risk category. 11 o'clock in the morning for everyone else. Come worship with us. Enjoy singing, praising the Lord, and hearing a message from God's Word. I want to thank you for your prayers. This is a great praying church, and we thank God for each one of you. And we want you to continue praying and pray that God will bless us, God will help us. And we need to pray for those who are still fighting this dreaded disease. We just pray that you'll just put your hand upon them. And uh, those who have lost their jobs because of COVID-19, it's been very difficult on some people. So we just really need to pray for them. Pray for our country and its leaders. They need our prayers. Our local leaders need your prayers as we as they decide the uh, openings and the other all the other dealings with this COVID-19. Pray for each other as we all face our individual problems and trials. It's been, like I said, so difficult for so many. And let's pray that God will put uh, his hand upon each one of us. Help us, strengthen us, give us guidance. God is good. Just remember, he has everything in, under control. We must trust him. He knows what he's doing. And let's just place our lives in his hands as we look to him for our help and our guidance. Let's pray together this evening. Father, we thank you so much for your love and your grace and your mercy. We thank you for this time we can gather around your word. And Father, we pray that you just put your hand upon us we pray for those who are still suffering from COVID-19. And Father, as some of the numbers are going up, we just pray that you'll just protect, and you'll guide and direct. And Father, I just pray that you'll bless our great church. We thank you for our people, the people who love you, who pray, who seek your face. Father, we just pray that you'll put your blessing upon our church, bless our pastor, bless our staff. And God, we just pray that you just move in our lives as we continue to trust you. We pray for our first responders again, Lord. I just pray that you'll keep them safe and well. We pray, Lord, that you'll just bless our nation. Father, such turmoil. And Father, I just pray that we'll turn from hate to love and turn to you. And Lord, and we'll humble ourselves and we'll pray and we'll seek your face. God, we pray that you'll just move in our lives and our church. We ask you tonight that you'll bless our study this evening. And we love you, and we praise you, and we give you the honor and glory that you so deserve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome to our Bible study. We invite you to follow along with us in Luke chapter 19. And appreciate it if you turn in your Bibles and follow along with us. The title of our message tonight is Occupy Till I Come. We're going to start in verse 11. And for those who are taking notes, we'll be going down through verse number 27. Uh, Jesus is still in Jericho as we go through this passage. Christ has revealed his purpose in verse number 10 of chapter 19. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He previously demonstrated that purpose in the lives of Zacchaeus and Bartimaeus. And Christ is now getting ready to make his way up to Jerusalem, beginning uh, the last week, the Passion Week, before he becomes the sacrifice for our sins at Calvary. Now, unfortunately, there's uh, still some misunderstanding among the people that Christ is talking to concerning his purpose. The overwhelming majority of the crowd thinks he's on his way to Jerusalem to set up the kingdom and miraculously throw out the Roman government. Now, the people were very weary of Roman rule and were ready for a deliverer to set them free. So uh, Jesus tells them a story in this passage, a parable, and uh, he's trying to help them understand, even though he knew it would be after all the events uh, that transpire at Jerusalem, uh, before his disciples really begin to get this, uh, he at least prepares the way for them to eventually understand it. Uh, I'd like to read all the way through this text, and then we'll go back and uh, we'll explain it. Let's begin in verse number 11 of Luke chapter 19. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable, because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. 
He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have laid up in a napkin. And for I feared thee, because thou art an austere man, thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he said unto him, Out of thy own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knowest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required my own with usury? And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you, that unto every one which hath it shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath, shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Now, before we get started, I just want to make sure that we don't confuse this parable with the parable of the talents that's given to us in Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 through 30. Uh, that is an entirely different story. It's a different setting. It's a different audience. It's different details, different characters, different rewards, different application. But there are some similarities, and sometimes people want to, to lump them both together, but they are not the same. So a little bit of a historical background to this parable in the story that Jesus gives. Uh, the crowd that was listening to him would have easily understood this parable that Jesus uses to illustrate the point because it was the world in which they lived. The Romans ruled their conquered lands through subordinate rulers. And so Rome would conquer a land, and then they would appoint someone to help rule that land. And what they wanted more than anything else was, was just to keep the peace in all of these areas. And so all of these subordinate rulers were approved and appointed by Rome. Uh, the Jewish people, though, they really didn't like anyone ruling over them. So historically, they had always complained and appealed to, to Rome to change the ruler. And uh, that happened on several occasions. Uh, the ru rulers continually had difficulty gaining the favor of the people. And uh, granted, that was often because of their questionable character. And a lot of the people that were appointed, they were not good men. And we look at the Herods and the Pilots and all those, they weren't great people. And But Rome just kept replacing uh, these rulers with a series of governors. Pilate was the fifth. So that kind of shows you how much had transpired and changed through the years. And so this story would immediately have made sense to the Jewish leaders and listeners when Jesus says, hey, there's somebody coming and this noble man is going to reign. He's going to set up a kingdom, but the citizens hate him and they want to replace him with someone else. And uh, it was their world. So uh, just a little bit of an overview of what we're looking at in this parable. And uh, then we'll get down to the details. Uh, this par parable is about a noble man. And uh, the noble man is a good man. There's, when you think of the word noble man, it's someone that is trustworthy, someone that's reliable. And uh, this noble man leaves for a distant country to receive a kingdom. He's leaving instructions while he's away for his servants to fulfill his responsibility in his absence. And uh, then some of his enemies, uh, however, are going to send a delegation to the ruler who was over all of them to grant him his kingdom and they wanted to express the desire that this noble man not be appointed a ruler over them. And uh, remember, all of this uh, takes place within the confusion of the people that are listening to Christ. Uh, they failed to accept that the mission of Christ was to seek and to save those who were lost from verse number 10. Uh, they were all clinging to this hope of an earthly kingdom that Christ was going to set up. 
and they thought that the time was now for that to happen. He's going to go up to Jerusalem. He's going to wipe out the Romans, and maybe an army from heaven's going to come. Whatever in their imagination, you know, they believed that Christ was going to reign as king. And uh, their anticipation was growing with every step that they took as they neared Jerusalem. Uh, but the earthly kingdom was going to be delayed. And uh, we know a lot of the rest of the story. Christ would first be rejected by his own people. Uh, he would die in Jerusalem. He would be buried. He would rise again. He would eventually ascend into heaven. We are living now during the prolonged absence as he is away. And we are awaiting his eventual triumphant return when he shall reign as king of kings and lord of lords and set up his kingdom. And so all those things with the cross and our redemption have to transpire before Christ can set up this kingdom that everyone was looking for. So that's the background of the story. That's kind of the overview of what we're looking at. Now let's look into the details of the characters and the people that are involved. And, and what I really want you to do is to ask yourself as we go through the story, where do I fit? Who am I in the story? How does this apply to me today? And let's start reading in verse number 12. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And so the first thing that we want to consider is the master. And then the second thing we want to consider are the servants in verse number 13. He called his 10 servants and delivered them 10 pounds and said unto them, occupy till I come. So we have the master that's going away. He's promising to establish a kingdom. He has servants that he wants to occupy until he returns. And the nobleman in this story represents Jesus Christ. Uh, he has journeyed to, for, to a far and distance, distant country waiting to receive a kingdom for himself. And while he is away, his servants, those that are his followers, the Christians today, are entrusted to occupy until he returns. Now, that word occupy comes from a Greek word from which we get our word pragmatic, and it literally means to busy oneself. And uh, the thought is, is that you're going to do it pragmatically, that you're going to do it on purpose, you're going to do it intentionally. You're intentionally keeping yourself busy and working while you're waiting for the return of the master. So those who follow Christ are referred to as his servants. And we are to pragmatically approach his business and those responsibilities of the nobleman while he is away. And so the master has entrusted us with something. And we're to be productive and we're to be profitable with the task. And the more productive we are, the more profitable we are, the more we show our love and respect for the master and our commitment to his business. Uh, while he's away... Now, we're responsible. When he returns, we are accountable. We are accountable to the master, and those who are faithful upon his, re his return will be rewarded. So we have the master, verse number 12. We have the servants, verse number 13. Now let's look at the citizens in verse number 14. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And I think this is an extremely sad part of the story. Uh, it represents the nation of Israel as a whole. They hated him without a cause. John chapter 1, verse 11, For he came unto his own, and his own received him not. They hated him so much that within a little over a week from this moment that this story, this parable is being given, they will literally murder him and crucify him at Calvary. And they say, he will not reign over us. Today, that represents every Christ-rejecting sinner uh, unwilling to submit themselves to the Lordship of Christ and receive him as their Savior. Uh, but having said that, whether a person receives him or rejects him, it's not going to change the fact that the nobleman will reign. He is coming back to establish his kingdom, and everyone will be under their rule. Now, just uh, jumping ahead a little bit, the end of these citizens in verse number 27, those my enemies, that's the citizens, which would not that I should reign, people who would not allow the lordship of Christ and Christ to reign over their life. 
bring them hither and slay them before me. And the thought is, is they will never enjoy the kingdom. Uh, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And their end is eternal judgment. Now, that is a sobering warning to those who reject Christ. I just want to say again, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants all men everywhere to be a part of his eternal kingdom. He wants all of us to come into his family, but those who reject him will be eternally lost forever. And so we see in verse 15 uh, the assurance that the king's coming. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, so he will be king, that he commanded these servants to be called unto him to me, given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. And this is the accountability part. But first we see that Jesus is coming back. He will reign. His foes will not be able to prevent him from taking his kingdom. Uh, he will establish his kingdom. There will be a reckoning day. Uh, we will all stand before him. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He will be crowned as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's going to happen. Uh, but the next part of this is we see uh, more commentary on the servants. And uh, notice in verse number 13, when we first introduced them, he called them his 10 servants. And so they did belong to him, and all the servants are supposed to occupy. We'll find in this passage as we continue that not all of the servants are faithful. Now, while we are waiting for his return, and here we are today waiting for the, king, the kingdom to come, we're waiting for Jesus Christ to return, we're during that long period, that prolonged period of waiting for his triumphal return, during that time, we are all supposed to be pragmatically, actively busy working for his future kingdom. We are to take what he has given us and entrusted us with, and we are to use it effectively. Now, the question would be, as we look at this and we think about these pounds and what it is, what has he entrusted us with? And we can just read the gospel as a whole and, you know, make some general application there because it's the meaning of the word and meaning of the scripture what has christ entrusted us with one thing that he's entrusted us with is the gospel he's literally commissioned us uh, with adding and multiplying converts uh, all of the servants uh, in this passage are given the exact same amount 10 pounds it was about three months wages and so God has extended and entrusted to us our resources, and he expects us to use those resources wisely. He wants us to do the most we can, the best we can, with what we have, with what he has given us. So the departing Lord went away, and he leaves behind this handful of servants, and they are called and they are commissioned to make capital for the Lord while he is away. He's given us the gospel. He's given us resources to advance that gospel. And when he returns, we are summoned to give an account of our stewardship. What have you done with the things that I've given you? What have you done with the things that I placed in your trust? So the first servant comes in this verse, in verse 16, and he says, Lord, I've gained 10 pounds. He had 10 pounds that was given to him. He doubled. He had 10 pounds more. Wow, that's impressive. And he had doubled everything that was given to him. And so he replies to him, well done, thou good uh, servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little. Have thou authority over 10 cities. Second service comes. He, this is also good. He says, Lord, I took the 10. I've gained five. That's still a great percentage. He said, likewise to him, be thou also over five cities. Uh, the reference to these cities is certainly a reference to the coming kingdom of God and that you're going to rule and reign with, uh, with the king. Now, both of these servants did what they could with what they had, and that was enough. Uh, the master doesn't have any trouble evaluating and rewarding them based on their different abilities, their opportunities, their activities. One gained 10, that's great. One gained five, that's great. The results were not the same, but one is determined to be just as faithful as the other. The issue is to faithfully serve the Lord Jesus with what we have, and do the best we can with what we have, maximizing the spiritual privileges that he grants us 
using them, not for our honor and glory, but for his honor and glory. Uh, but what about this third servant? And the one that we would determine is not a faithful servant. Uh, we could say as a whole that he misevaluates his master. He doesn't understand his master. He doesn't know the heart and mission of the master. Uh, he's lazy. He's indifferent. He doesn't do anything. He, he has these opportunities, but he wastes his opportunities. He had no desire to honor his master. Instead of being driven by love, he appears to be motivated by fear. Uh, he even accuses the king of being severe, harsh, strict, and unfair. And uh, you, you notice, he says, I feared thee. You're an austere man. And then he says, you take up that thou layest not down and reap where you didn't sow. It, it, that's really disturbing because he's, he's accusing the master of taking crops that he didn't even plant. And I wow, that's pretty brazen. And so he must not really know the master. He has no real relationship with his master. If he had any respect for the king, he could have at least invested for minimal gain. And that's pointed out to him. And so he said unto him in verse 22, the reply of the master, Out of thy own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. And he said, well, you could have given money to the bank. And you might have you know, at least made some interest on it if you just put it in a bank and not put it in a napkin. And, and so the king takes his words at face value. This is what you say I am. If that's what you think, that's what you're going to receive. You're going to receive nothing. No reward. I'm not even going to let you keep what you had. You're going to suffer loss. And so this servant has no power, no privilege, no position in the kingdom. That which was given to the one could be entrusted, and uh, that which he had was given to the first guy. He said, I'm going to take your 10 pounds and give it to him. Now you add that up, the guy now has 30 pounds, and uh, and why did he give it to him? Well, he's already proven that he's trustworthy, and uh, he and this man's going to enter the kingdom with nothing. And uh, so as by fire, as we see in another place in the scripture, and people begin to kind of cry out about that. In verse 25, Lord, that's not fair. Uh, the legalistic person has, you know, this eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. They understand nothing of God's grace. This, this unfaithful servant represents those today that are surrounded by all of the privilege and all of the truth of the gospel, but they never change. They never grow. They never produce fruit. They just come and sit but they never enjoy the, the blessings. They never get involved. They never do anything with what has been entrusted to them to further the kingdom, to advance God's cause. They are unfaithful servants. So the question again that we started with, where are you in this story? There's only a few places that you can be. I count three. We know that we're not the nobleman. We're not the one in charge. We're not the king. We are either citizens who don't want him reigning over us, and we will not become a part of his kingdom, or we are servants. And those servants can either be faithful servants or unfaithful servants. And so, like the unfaithful servant, are you sitting and doing nothing with what God has entrusted you, or are you like the faithful servants saying, I'm doing everything that I can with what God has given me and with what God has entrusted me to advance his cause. Are you able to say, I am faithfully occupying until the master comes? That's our responsibility. And it, it shows action, occupy. It's pragmatic, busily working, being about the task, intentional. So what we know from this passage is that, yes, Jesus is coming. The goal of the child of God as a servant is not to be ashamed before him when he comes. When you see Jesus face to face, you don't want to have to duck your face in shame. You want to be able to look into his glorious face, the one who saved you by his grace, being willing to say, I've done everything that I could with what you entrusted me with, and I've been faithful, and have the Lord look at you and say, well done. 
Thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of the Lord and his kingdom. So perhaps you're here today, though, and you've never accepted the king. Maybe you're one of the citizens. Maybe there's even been a point in your life where you thought, I really don't want Jesus reigning and ruling over me. I want to be my own person. I want to do my own thing. I want you to recognize that the end of the story and throughout the story, it shows that Jesus Christ will reign. Jesus will return. He will be established as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Those that are a part of his family will be welcomed into the kingdom. Those servants that have been faithful will say, yes, I've done all that I can. There will be some unfaithful servants who didn't do what they could do and all that they could do, and they're going to be ashamed at his coming. But there are going to be many of those who you'll say, I never knew you, depart from me. But right now you still have time. You still have time to be a part of the family of God. You still have time to be one of his servants. You still have time to enter into his family and accept him as your Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ, from this passage on, is headed to Jerusalem. One purpose, to give his life and to die, that our sins might be atoned for and paid for, and that we might have eternal life and live with him forever in his eternal kingdom. That's why he came, to seek and to save that which was lost. If you are those who are not a part of his family, I urge you to either email us or call us, or at any moment we can help you. We want to point you to the one who loves you, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this parable. I thank you for what it represents and what it means. And I pray that you'll help us all to first make sure that we're one of your servants, that we're part of the family, that we're going to be a part of the eternal kingdom, that we've received you as our Savior. And once we've determined that, Lord, help us to be faithful to occupy, to work for you, and to give our lives for you. Yes, we're saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. There's nothing that we can do to earn our salvation. But Lord, Ephesians 2.10 says we're your workmen, and we don't want to be ashamed, and we want to be faithful. And we want to be found faithful. Lord, help us all to determine that we will be faithful in the giving of our lives and our heart to you. And Lord, if there's someone here that's listening to this that's never received you as their Savior, I pray that they would bow their head and confess their sins and make you the Lord of their life. Lord, we love you and we thank you for loving us. We look forward to your coming. We look forward to your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining with us tonight. And may the Lord bless you all. Good night.